Welcome to the fourth panel organized by Granting Foundation on Facing Difficult Pasts. Institutions that focus in this field make a contribution to social transformation thanks to the designs that they make and museums try to answer new questions as a person involved in the work of museums. We try to answer the question how we can uh, explain traumatic issues to children. We have two speakers, Andrzej Kartorsik from Poland and we have Georgina Markwest with us. Unfortunately, our third speaker, Cornelia Sberg, is not going to join us because of her illness. First, I will give you some brief information about uh, the institutions that our speakers represent, and then I'll open the platform. <laughs> Welcome again to the panel of practices dealing with difficult pasts, transformative education programs in museum. I'm the director of the Jewish Museum of Turkey uh, that was inaugurated in 2001. Our museum promotes the history of the Jews whose existence dates back to 2,600 years of time. And also uh, we show the customs and traditions of the Turkish Jewish people in the museum. Back to our subject, we will have presentations with our distinguished guests who are representing countries with a long history of discrimination. Happy to have two institutions who have different ways to deal with the past. So I will first start with the Auschwitz Birkenau State Museum. Uh, in 1947, the Polish Parliament established the State Museum, whose task was to collect and preserve all traces of crimes committed against the victims. Since then, more than 40 million of people from all around the world visited this site, and Auschwitz has become the symbol of Shoah and genocide. From the very beginning of the museum's existence, at the site of the former German Nazi, Nazi concentration and extermination camp, its mission has been to teach about the victims, their tragedy, and the history of the last preserved Holocaust sites. The authenticity of Auschwitz Birkenau and the survivors' testimonies enable us to understand the mechanism of intolerance, racism, and anti-Semitism. Andrzej Kastorczyk, uh, he has been working at the museum since 1997. He first started as a guide, and then uh, he he went to the uh, he employed at the education department. While the International Center for Education at Auschwitz and the Holocaust came into e existence, he became the organization's manager since 2010. Currently, he is a director. He graduated from the Higher School of Pedagogy in Opel and the Teacher Training College in Biasco Biela. He also completed the postgraduate studies in the field of history and museology at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Floor is yours. Jak szang masz? Good afternoon. Uh, I am very, very uh, pleased and honored to be here among uh, uh, among you. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like uh, tell something about as an introduction about uh, Auschwitz Birkenau, not about its history, but more about the victims and the background. Uh, the present and the future of the education. The second part, I would like to show you a fragment, a part of a movie about conservation works uh, in Auschwitz Birkenau Memorial. Ah, uh, the first photograph is more moving than many other photographs that show directly the cruelty of the perpetrators. The group of the teenagers, well and neatly dressed, there is something strange and elusive in these figures, which cannot be adequately defined. Peace and quiet around rural landscape somewhere in Poland. Eyes 
strangely focused and heads bent down. It brings anxiety. Eyes reflect that something is going on, what may change lives of those young, mindful and well-educated people. The photograph was taken not far away from Oświęcim, a small town in south of Poland, uh, where in 1940 was established the camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. The photograph was taken around noon on the 1st of September 1939. A few hours earlier, Germans attacked Poland. War machine, which couldn't be stopped, was put into operation. Teenagers' eyes do not even want to confront the lens of the camera. They turn their heads, their faces are fleetfully serious. They go out on a road to wait for their fathers who are to bring latest news from the war front. And then somebody captured this moment in the photograph. With, the, with this picture, I want to say you that in each time we should teach about Auschwitz, not, not only about Auschwitz, but also in broader context, the history and responsibility for the history. Uh, this, in this time, the first September, uh, the first September 1939, the war machine uh, couldn't be stopped. It's begun the war, but the Auschwitz was not in that time established. In the next picture, other, ch other children, other clothes, not a wooden barrier welcoming guests, but barbed wire, insulators, and the inscription, Achtung Hochspannung, attention, high voltage, eyes, Staring in the lens, such sad, longing, and vastly experienced eyes. In both photographs, eyes and faces of children and teenagers are unprecedented indictment against the Nazi perpetrators. There is the photograph which was taken after liberation, in uh, after 27 of January 1945, a group of Jewish, a small group, very small group of liberated Jewish children in Auschwitz. Oh, sorry. Yes, no. Who are the victims of Auschwitz. We know, uh, we know very many about them. 90% of the, all victims were Jews. They were killed from one reason. They were Jewish. It was not important how old they were. Men, women, children, We decided was the fact that they were Jewish. They were Jews. Wagons full of Jews crowded in often terrible conditions from France, Germany, Holland, Belgium, Italy, Greece, occupied Poland. About 1.1 deportees, about 1 million Jewish victims. We see here, on this, uh, in the, in this, uh, here the pictures of the Jewish families, babies, parents, a watch, other photographs. They are uh, dead, 
there is only a part of the personal belongings which we have in Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. The second group of the victims, the second largest group of the victims of Auschwitz were Polish political prisoner and uh, other Polish Christian from occupied Poland. About 150,000 people were deported uh, to Auschwitz. About 50% from there were murdered uh, in the concentration camp. The first group of this prisoner were include soldiers and representatives of underground organizations. There are also young people, teenage boys, scouts who were enough, who, who were cut on the border trying to get into the, into the Polish army in, the, in France. They are also representatives of the intelligentsia the group that the Nazi want to destroy at the very beginning. So there are doctors, lawyers, artists. Uh, I said 150,000 people, from then the 50% were killed. We see a whole wall with the uh, with a picture of this uh, people also here. And the third and the fourth group of the victims, they were Roma people. We see a colorful portrait, one of the victims, and uh, the cologne of the Soviet prisoner of war. Fourth biggest group of the victims in Auschwitz. Mm, sorry. It is possible that Nothing would have been left after liberation, after liberation of the former Auschwitz camp if it had been for prisoners, especially those of Polish origin. There was a national, nationwide discussion in Poland in that time, in this 1946 and 1947, on what to do with this place. Some wanted to destroy it as a symbol of evil, or built a school here, but former prisoners wanted to create a memorial site. And here we see two pictures, uh, documentary pictures, uh, and on the pictures, the former prisoner, young men and women, the first people who worked as a memorial site rangers. Uh, here in, uni in uniform, and here some, uh, some years later, in the 60s, free museum employee. The main, after the war, Auschwitz has become a powerful metaphor, a point of reference for examination of other acts of genocide, atrocious crimes, including natural disasters, Auschwitz is one of the most dramatic words, terms, used to convey everything that seems to be the evil in the modern world. Here we see the uh, member of uh, different delegations, religious group, politicians, and other people. And on the next slide you see, uh, you see three uh, heads of uh, Catholic Church, three popes, all were in Auschwitz with a visit. The main objective of Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum and memorial activities is to fill the world, Auschwitz, with a content. It is our aim to demonstrate that Auschwitz is not only a watchword and a symbol, but it is a real area and refers to historical event and the tragedy of an individual human being. A walk along the footsteps of camp victims on authentic site of the historical area of Auschwitz-Birkenau leaves an indelible mark in the memory of people visiting this place. The place and the guide's explanations bring visitors closer to the tragedy of Jewish mothers, women, children, men, members of Jewish communities from all over world, uh, of, of all over Europe occupied by the Third Reich. 
The authentic site of historical area expounds so many facts concerning the fate of other groups of victims, Poles, Roma, Soviets, prisoner of war, and all other victims. And now, I would like to describe you what we, what we, what is our legacy? What is, what, uh, what we do to keep the memory, to, uh, to share the history among the next generations. First of all, the guiding tours, tours with the uh, with educators. This is our basic form of education. Therefore, we have a very big group of guides. There's 328 guides, uh, which uh, are available in 20 languages, uh, and other additional data, guides by languages. It is also, we also focused on them to give the opportunity to meet somebody in Auschwitz who will speak in my language, in language my mother, in language my heart, in language which I know from school, and, and therefore these 20 languages. Of course, English language is the first one, the second is Polish, then German and French. This is So many people uh, took part uh, till the uh, in, in in each year in the guided uh, tours together with our educators. It means more than almost one million seven hundred thousand were guided, but our educators. It means so many people had. A lesson about Auschwitz with a professional educator. Wow. What we do that I mentioned that our educator are professional for arm trainings, for all trainings, preparation to the uh, to the function and to be a guide, and then the post-graduate uh, uh, trainings in Poland, but also in different countries from where Jews were deported to Auschwitz. Uh, the number of visitors uh, in, year two, in year 2017 we had more than one, uh, two million one hundred thousand visitors. This year will will be more. Uh, this is the, the end of the to the end of the September, uh, two thousand eighteen. Then uh, additional activities uh, organized by different organization. I would like to mention the March of the Living. Uh, in which take part also a group of students from uh, from Turkey. This is a kind of invitation for you, for your, uh, for other uh, teachers and people who are interested in the history uh, uh, of Auschwitz and the Holocaust. Each year we organize the international summer academies in English and in German. And in one week time you can take part in a special program, lectures, uh, study visits in, uh, in the Auschwitz Memorial, also in Oświęcim town and the Jewish center in Oświęcim and also in Krakow, in Krakowia. The next proposal, it is a special project uh, dedicated to the stu for the students in Polish, in English and in Hebrew. Uh, this uh, you can find it in our, on our website. 
uh, this is the history of the Polish citizens and Auschwitz Birkenau. But when we speak about Polish citizens, it means not only not only Polish political prisoners, but first of all about Jewish victims, because mostly Jews were deported from the occupied Poland to Auschwitz, 300,000 people, and uh, therefore it is the very good proposal. I would like to suggest also to see the film witnesses about the fight of uh, of the mm, different groups of victims in Auschwitz. The next step in our education is the big challenge because we have a contact with very small group of uh, survivors uh, from Auschwitz and uh, and therefore, we decided to work with their families, with the next generations. Therefore, we started to organize uh, the meetings and discussions on the topic of memory about uh, with the uh, with the relatives of a former prisoner. The second and last invitation for today is to the International Educational Conference. Next year, in July, every two years, we organize a very big international conference about uh, education in the authentic memorial sites for people from the entire world. Uh, we, we will publish in a few weeks our uh, invitation uh, on our website, but I can say you now that this uh, conference will take part in, uh, will, uh, will, we will have in, in July 2019. Temporary exhibitions which are available and you can lend it and uh, we, you know, we bring this, uh, this exhibitions to different countries and uh, in not only in Europe but also in other continents. Uh, they are uh, about the history of Auschwitz, history of the memorial site, about the art in in uh, in uh, the concentration camp, how it was possible that uh, that the prisoner the, who were imprisoned in this very bad conditions, they were able to find something uh, to uh, to 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 do a small sculpture or uh, illegal um, illegal uh, drawing. Uh, next, uh, very important exhibition about uh, the work of Sonderkommando and the emotions and experience of one uh, survivor, uh, survivor from the crematorium number three. Uh, we present this exhibition till the end of March 2019. The next exhibition together with uh, Amut Esh uh, Foundation about the rule, uh, rule of faith and religion in the Aus in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. Uh, we organize it together with uh, uh, a Jewish organization from America, but we, we would like to speak not only about Jewish uh, religion and Jewish faith, but also uh, different other religions. Uh, traveling exhibitions only mentioned and volunteers. Here I would like to stop for uh, one moment. It is uh, very close connected with our preservation works. Uh, young people, university students, or younger uh, professional students, from, uh, for example, uh, students uh, from uh, Volkswagen concern, take part in a special program uh, in Auschwitz uh, in the preservation 
in the preservation department. What they do, very important work. You see here, these young people, by cleaning uh, original, authentic tile, uh, roof tile, uh, and also in the next picture, uh, preservation works in the one of the wooden barracks in uh, Birkenau camp. We do our best to say thank you to these young people from all over the world and we have two kinds of awards. Once a year uh, we distinguish 10 people, 10 uh, uh, volunteers, interns, volunteers, co coordinators. This is the special award. Uh, you uh, can imagine it is also a uh, quotation from the Bible and uh, and from this very hard discuss uh, discussion uh, about uh, among Abraham and God uh, and therefore we 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 believe that also volunteer work uh, guarantee uh, our existence in Auschwitz and helped us do something is to, this is also something new it is also part of quotation this small pin uh, received each our volunteer after his her uh, work for auschwitz uh, do something means do something after the time your activity is Begun. You, you can start now in the world to change the world, uh, to be active. And uh, at the end, uh, only an uh, example, one special group uh, hearing impaired students from Wrocław, carpenters, who uh, since one year came to Auschwitz and do very meaningful work for us uh, with the original authentic, uh, for example, uh, equipment, wooden equipment in the camp uh, and uh, the last one part are the online lesson. We don't print uh, very many materials but first of all we uh, we have all our material in the website. In uh, the basic form uh, are the lessons in, uh, in Polish and in English, but also some uh, new lessons uh, are in other languages uh, available as Hebrew uh, or German, Russia and other anniversary of the liberation. Do I have this five minutes? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Then uh, now I would like to, it is our present, but I would like to share with you, uh, with them what is our aim for the future. Because we have the very big, authentic memorial site with this 150 barracks, 300 ruins, 200 hectares of the area, the ruins of the gas chambers, crematoria, hundreds of thousands of personal belongings, um, of items of personal belongings of the Jewish people. And therefore, this is, they are our tools to work. How to work? I would like to, to show you with these small films. Uh, you see conservation works uh, in the brick barracks in Birkenau. And I would like to comment uh, what do the, uh, our, uh, our employee and uh, to see something about education, how the future of education at the memorial sites will be shaped without those ones who survived and only with the memory about them. One, 
moment. Jews, Poles, Roma, Soviets prisoner of war. Two factors are becoming a signpost for education. What remained after the camp and how to, uh, how to site is treated. In order to preserve the material evidence of Auschwitz, we follow certain principles. First of all, we preserve all what remained not to destroy anything. Therefore, we try to save every object, every piece of a document, the slightest trace of life or death of every victim. No efforts have been spared to save even a crumb of the camp wall. Another rule, we do not rebuild, reconstruct, or add anything. What survived will be preserved. What was destroyed by the German perpetrators will remain a ruin, a trace, and an unfinished structure, sometimes only a place or a point in a map. This guideline is also applicable to such objects as victims' shoes. Therefore, tens of thousands of shoes belonging to Auschwitz deportees, which are displayed on the exhibition, look like then when they had been found, crumpled, worn out, and the matched. So they become the carries of individual stories of the victims. According to, the, to another rule of the preservation code introducing any non-original elements is only possible in the case of the necessity to protect an original object or structure, mainly including all structures reinforcing roofs and walls. However, the object of this special significance is a notorious inscription over the Camp Arbeit macht frei, Camp Gate. Due to its fragility and delicacy, we decide to store and protect it in a warehouse and replace with its copy at the memorial site. How these preservation principles are transferred to the world of education. The first rule, to preserve everything what remained, means to preserve memory about all victims. Those ones whose names we know and unidentified, unidentified individuals whose names will remain undiscovered. It means not to leave any detail unnoticed, which may enable us to discover what happens with a human being when hatred and disdain become an official state doctrine. The second rule, not to re re renew or correct, which forces us not to turn away and to con confront horrific crime and its dimension, it is the way to preserve sharpness and expressiveness of the Auschwitz message and to make us aware what is happening around me in my country, on my continent, and in my world. The third rule, the necessity of interfere to support the structure, in my opinion, this is the most important and current rule. It should stimulate us to breaking inactivity, passivity, and being a bystander. This rule means not only responsibility, but also necessity to take brave decisions and actions when we see, hear, or recognize signs indicating upcoming catastrophe. If today we can expre express something very loudly, it is a watchword, but not the watchword never again. It doesn't work. We know. We can, but we can say never again, not be a bystander, never again be indifferent. 
petit chocolat. Appertat Museum, are you ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Appertat Museum opened in 2001. is acknowledged as the preeminent museum in the world dealing with the 20th century South Africa. It illustrates the rise and fall of apartheid. Museum in Johannesburg is being visited by a large number of students on a daily basis, unlike the other state museums. By taking into account the South African context and the practicabilities of the apartheid museum, Marquess research attempts to understand the quality of learning that is currently experienced at the museum and make recommendations that will assist in improving the current state of the museum's education program. Georgina is a coordinator of the education department. After attending a Bachelor of Arts degree with a triple major in English, History and Politics at the University of Cape Town, she completed a, completed a postgraduate certi cert cert certificate in education <laughs> in senior phase, specializing in English and history in 2014. Georgina graduated with her MA in Long Display and is currently working for the Apartheid Museum developing an educational program at the Nelson Mandela Capture site in Howick. Thank you. Please. Good evening, everyone. I'm not very well acquainted with presentations, so just be kind to me. <laughs> um, I work for the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, um, but I'm actually based in, at the site of their new museum, which is the Nelson Mandela Capture site, which we plan on opening uh, beginning of 2019. So I, I've been tasked with creating the education program for the new museum. Um, and so in order to do that, I spent some time researching our current education program in Johannesburg. Um, and I wrote a thesis that, followed on the that focused on the quality of learning um, experienced at the museum. Uh, but before I, I go into my research and what I've been doing, I thought it might be necessary um, just to give you a bit more background on apartheid. I don't know how familiar you are with the history of South Africa and apartheid. So just in case, you might find this very boring, but just in case he has this a bit more information about it. Uh, apartheid was a political and social system in South Africa that lasted from 1948 to the early 1990s. In this system, the people of South Africa were divided by their race, white, colored, Indian, and black. And those races were forced to live apart from each other. There were laws to maintain this racial separation, such as the Mixed Marriages Act, which made it a crime for people from different races to marry, and the Immorality Act, that went as far as to criminalize any sexual act between a white person and a person from another racial group. Two of the most crippling of these acts were the Group Areas Act and the Pass Laws. The Group Areas Act was passed in 1950, and it allowed the government to establish neighborhoods where only people of a particular race were allowed to live. The act displaced hundreds of thousands of people, breaking up families, friends, and communities. This was because once an area was declared a group area, the act had the power to demolish all the houses there and displace everyone who was not part of the designated racial group. The pass laws were a form of internal passport system that required only black South Africans to carry identity documents in the form of a reference book, essentially making black South Africans foreigners in their own country. Apartheid uh, was officially abolished in 1994, and the Apartheid Museum opened its doors to the public in November 2001. The history of the museum is interesting, as rather than based as an, at an authentic memory site, the museum came into being uh, after a casino complex was tasked with funding a social responsibility project in order to fund their license, to approve their license. Today, the museum operates as a not-for-profit company with an independent board of trustees. The casino covers the basic operational costs, and the museum has ongoing fundraising programs for all the rest of its projects. Uh, I also think it's important to pause here and explain a bit more about the schools that come to visit us uh, at the Apartheid Museum. We are visited by um, busloads and busloads of school children on a daily basis because Apartheid is very much a part of the school curriculum, so it, those, um, those buses are funded by the government or by the state. Um, but what can then happen is we, we receive 120 children at once, which can make a providing a meaningful education experience for them quite, quite a difficult task. 
The architecture of the building is like a prison or a fortress, a reminder of the harsh and stark reality of the past. Upon arrival, visitors are met by seven pillars that represent the seven fundamental values of South Africa's constitution. Freedom, respect, responsibility, diversity, reconciliation, equality, and democracy. Racial classification was the foundation of all apartheid laws, and in order to illustrate this, visitors to the museum are arbitrarily classified as either white or non-white, so they get a ticket when they enter which tells them which entry gate they are allowed to use. Once classified, visitors are only permitted to use the, the gate allocated to them. Identity documents were the main tool used to implement this divide, and many of these documents are on display. Having passed through these separate entrants, visitors walk along a path, showing images of some of those who journeyed to Johannesburg in the years following the discovery of gold. Together they made up a diverse and often racially mixed community. It was this racial mixing that segregation and apartheid were designed to prevent. Once inside, visitors are shown a series of 22 individual exhibition areas. One of these is a room with 131 nooses hanging from the ceiling to represent the 131 government opponents who were executed by the apartheid state. Another key exhibit is an armored vehicle known as a Casper, used to quell protests during the violent years of apartheid. The education program at the Apartheid Museum has been in operation since the museum opened its doors. We have always considered how to engage with schools. We've developed and published our own textbook and museum workbooks. We've run an annual educator training workshop and began in-house training of our guides to assist them in conducting tours with school groups. It was this commitment that saw our museum be publicly recognized for our efforts to prioritize education. In recent years, however, we have not had the staff capacity to champion education within the museum and government funding has dried up. Our textbooks have not been updated to reflect our changing curriculum, and our educator training program has ceased to exist. Our in-house guide training has also been sidelined to allow for other seemingly more important programs and exhibitions. It was this acknowledgement of the need to reinvest in our education program that informed my research. I wanted... Oh. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I wanted not only to improve the current offering of educational programs at the museum, but also to inform the implementation of a new program at the site of our new museum, the Nelson Mandela Capture Site. These were the questions that I first asked when I began my, re my thesis. I wanted to know not only if learning was happening, but if it was, what the quality of that learning was, which led me to ask, if and how educators prepare learners for a visit to the Apartheid Museum. What is the quality of learning that takes place during the visit? And what impact does a visit have on how learners understand Apartheid? But first, the question that I needed to answer was what defined quality learning? And how could I measure it? As you can imagine, measuring if and how much learning is happening inside a museum is not as simple as asking children to write a test at the end of their visit. And so, in answering this question, I looked at international trends, such as the generic learning outcomes you can see in front of you. This was a national framework developed in the United Kingdom that goes beyond knowledge and understanding to measure the effect of learning, prioritizing five different but equally important outcomes. Knowledge and understanding, enjoyment, inspiration, and creativity, intellectual, practical, and professional skills, activity, behavior, and progression, and finally, attitudes and values to allow for individual meanings to be accounted for. Adding to this, I also tried to consider the many challenges facing the South African education system. Most notably, the concerns surrounding the quality of educators in the country. The reality of South African schools is that the majority of teachers know little more about the subjects they are teaching than what is expected of their learners, with as many as 5,139 South African teachers defined as unqualified or underqualified. Okay. Using this information, I wrote down six questions I would like to try to answer. Like the three evaluation designs, these six questions were intentionally broad to allow for individual meanings. 
Start out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These questions were intentionally brought to allow for individual meanings to be accounted for. They attempted to account for the constructivist approach to learning favored in museums, while recognizing the need <laughs> Sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> they attempted to account for the constructivist approach to learning favored in museums while recognizing the need to expose learners to the curriculum. Finally, they attempted to be sensitive to the current crisis of educator quality experienced in South Africa. Before I launch into my findings, I want to pause for a moment to discuss my research methods. I'm not going to bore you for too long, but I will mention that I chose to use quota sampling and in total 65 schools participated in the study. Every effort was made to include learners from government and private schools, urban and rural, male and female, and all ethnic groups. Before I move on, I also want to mention the personal meaning maps. This was one of the methods that I used in my research. Um, one can be seen on the screen. Personal meaning maps are designed to assess how an educational experience affects an individual by investigating their knowledge and views about a particular topic prior to and after visiting the museum. Rather than a specific learning experience, personal meaning maps do not assume that all learners enter with comparable knowledge and experience. Rather, they attempt to consider the multi-dimensionality of learning. To assist in providing a more holistic understanding of the learning that was taking place at the Apartheid Museum, a small group of 49 learners were asked to complete personal meaning maps, the aim being to strengthen the reliability of the findings made from the questionnaires. Um, and were being completed immediately after the visit. So I visited a school the day before they visited the museum, and I gave them each a, a blank piece of paper, and I asked them to write the word apartheid in the middle of their paper, and they were then to write whatever they associated with apartheid down um, on that paper. I then collected the papers and returned to the school the day after their visit and gave the papers back with a different colored pen and this time told them to add to their papers so that afterwards I could compare their experience or what they knew of apartheid before with what they knew of apartheid afterwards and I could measure some kind of learning that may have taken place or an increased understanding. Yeah, that's just fine. Okay. Am I going slow enough? Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, okay, I'm not going to go into all my findings, but I'm just going to summarize that ultimately the picture that emerged was bleak. Although I knew our education program had lost its energy since the museum opened, I think I underestimated the extent of the problems we were facing when it came to engaging with school groups. It became clear almost immediately that our guides lacked the necessary training, making them unable to facilitate the experience in a meaningful way to school groups. There was no difference between the tours they were conducting for adults and the tours they gave to students. Although we had workbooks, they were not being used properly. And more than this, there were no standards or objectives for the guides, raising concerns about the well-being of the learners placed in their care. In addition to this, educators were failing to prepare learners for their visit, and on occasion behaved in completely inappropriate ways. In some of the most extreme cases, teachers would leave their learners with the guides, choosing to rather go to the restaurant or sit in the sun. In other ed instances, educators or teachers rushed the guide through the tour, so that they could go to the amusement park. Or worse still, some educators have arrived at our museum drunk with learners that have also been drinking. From these observations, it came as no surprise that learners' engagement with the museum was at best superficial. My research all reinforced the same conclusion. The quality of learning was disappointingly poor. It was clear that school groups were not coming to the apartheid museum to learn, nor were we creating an environment where learning could flourish. So I've got two examples of the, some of the personal meaning maps that were completed. Um, 
Before the visit, the learner had written four basic words and phrases, and after her visit, added three more phrases. All of the words or phrases related to the brutal treatment of people during apartheid, and her vocabulary remained simple. There was no elaboration, detail, or complexity in her post-visit. Almost no facts um, were added, and some personal meaning maps that did add facts, some of them had been misunderstood or misremembered. Um, despite this disappointing trend, I asked, um, question three revealed that the museum did in fact evoke a strong emotional response from learners. And 78% of, of the students used emotional language to describe their experience in the museum. I'm not sure how to do this. I'm going to play two quick clips. Hopefully they'll talk slower than me. Um, <laughs> of two uh, reviews of people that have been to the museum so you can understand some of um, what they're feeling after visiting. Um, it was shocking, really. Uh, I'm young. from the United States, uh, visiting, and I... My, my wife brought me here today to experience this, and I really wasn't sure what to, what to experience. Um, I only knew a little bit about apartheid from what I've read and seen in different media outlets. Uh, but in the U.S., we're pretty sheltered from what what we know to be true, and this truly opened my eyes to incredible social injustices done in South Africa for decades, uh, and it, it hurts to see it and feel it. Um, and then seeing South Africa now, and seeing it try to recover painfully is, is um, it's good to see, but it's, it's hard. But that kind of sums it up for me, I guess. I think it's been a mixture of pride and pain. Um, I think there are a lot of things that I was aware about in terms of our history. I've been to the Hector Peterson Museum. I've been to other historical sites across the country, but I think this place just brings a mixture of pride and pain, I think. I think my last section with the Truth and Reconciliation um, videos, it was all too much, I think. You go through all the other sections and you experience moments of happiness and moments of sadness, but that final exit is just, it all becomes too much to bear, I think. Here are some of the responses we received in our post-tour questionnaire. They ranged from extremely positive, wanting to take change and become agents of change. So comments such as, the new generation is blessed. Um, if you believe in something, you should not give up. The children of today have ability to reach their dreams. Uh, treat everyone like a human. I won't be a racist. I want to be a doctor and save money to help people to becoming incredibly negative as well. Uh, when blacks were beaten up, when Africans were being killed, seeing blacks being abused, hating, killing, hell on earth, inequality and injustice, blacks being treated like animals, white people abusing black people. We will never let whites own South Africa, never. I will fight the whites because they killed black people. That is my promise, to never let whites treat us like they treated our old and blacks. If I wasn't a Christian, I would hate whites. Though it is clear that the museum evokes an emotional response in learners, it also raises questions of whether or not the museum is able to manage those responses in a way that is both educational and constructive. This concern is highlighted when considering the failure of the museum to enforce age restrictions on certain exhibits. There's currently no clear strategy or policy to deal with the way the experience is managed. Although high numbers of educators are very um, impressed with our workbooks and, and we, they'll take them, they're not being used effectively in the museum. And on, during my observations, instead of seeing them being written in or used, they would be rolled up or sat on or left behind. And so, we needed to also rethink how our workbooks were being used in the museum. Our guides also hadn't been trained on the new curriculum or the, the changes to the curriculum, so they were unable to facilitate 
um, using these workbooks. So this concern, along with a number of others, were raised with the management staff when I completed my thesis, and we immediately set to work on improving the current program. We still have a long way to go, but in the last 12 months, we have started to see a small improvement from school groups. We have started... Um, we have reintroduced guide training, so we now have regular sessions and simple policies and procedures have been introduced as well as helping guides to make their tours inclusive and accessible, aligning the tour to the curriculum and introducing meaningful reflection activities has been some of, some of the things we've been working on. Um, we've improved the structure of the sessions. Before, uh, the introduction would take 15 minutes and by the end of that, the, the students had already lost interest. So I would find in the post-tour questionnaire, when learners or students were asked to recall something about apartheid, they could only draw on that initial 15-minute introduction because after that, they hadn't been able to take in any more information. So instead now, we do a start activity. Um, the, the, we then do a 45-minute lesson or tour through the museum. We then give them a break to go to the loo or just have a bit of a time out and then we get back together for another 45 minutes where we reflect on what we've seen. We've also updated our um, curriculum materials and we've, before we only uh, focused on the history subject but now we look at art history and we've also got a subject in South Africa called tourism so we look at that as well as another subject called life orientation so we've increased the range of materials. We've also improved communication with teachers. So we now send out a monthly newsletter and we have a database where we collect their email addresses if we ever need to contact them. We've also introduced an online booking form so we can try to gather more information about the schools before they arrive to help our, us plan our tours better. Um, and we've also attempted to introduce strict rules and policies to deal with both teachers and students who misbehave. So, for example, we now enforce a code of conduct that all um, educators and learners must sign that goes, sort of helps them understand the expectations that we have for how they behave when they're in the museum. We still have a long way to go, but believe that acknowledging where we have been going wrong is the first step to transforming our education program. Is it changing? No. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so just to end, <laughs> sorry, just to end, I've just got some pictures to show you some of the work we've been doing since we've been making the changes. So this is one of our reflection sessions and another one of our reflection sessions. I don't know what's happened to the other pictures. But anyway, I'm sure you're bored of pictures. Oh, there's one. <laughs> And thank you for your time. Sorry, I spoke too fast. <laughs> thank you. Thank. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you both. Uh, <laughs> thank you both for your presence. I'm honored to host high regarded experts and more than satisfied with the effectiveness of this conference. And thank you for this opportunity to Granting Foundation. I believe that this panel will contribute to social transformation through implementing education programs and developing pedagogic materials which foster mutual understanding, empathy, and dialogue.